uh, without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Alex. Jennifer has a doctorate in physical therapy. She is a neurologic specialized physical therapist with 14 years of experience working in a variety of settings. She is certified through the Parkinson Wellness Recovery Organization. She currently offers community-based exercise classes for individuals with Parkinson's disease through the nonprofit organization, PD Connect. Jennifer, all yours. Thank you so much for being here. All right, well, thank you all for taking your time on a Thursday evening to be here. And, you know, it's great. I see a lot of familiar faces from my class. Um, so I'm really excited to get a chance to talk to you tonight. I specialize in neuro. Um, I've worked in a variety of settings, inpatient, outpatient neuro, and now I'm really involved on the community exercise side of working with patients with Parkinson's. And I know a lot of you are told by your physical therapist and your neurologist how important it is for you to exercise. And I want to empower you with some of the research so you understand why people are making those recommendations. And I want you to be able to better structure your exercise routine um, based on what the research is saying. This is a super challenging time for everybody with shelter in place. Um, so we really have to work together as a community to find creative ways to keep us all moving. So like I said, we're going to cover three main points. We're going to review the research related to exercise and Parkinson's disease. We're going to discuss how to organize your routine. And then I'm certified in something called the POWER program. And for those of you that aren't familiar, I'll talk a little bit about it during the lecture, um, but we might do a little bit of movement and demonstration of some of those power exercises later on. Okay, hold on one second. Okay. So, Frequently, I get asked, why do, what got you hooked? Why do you work, why do you care so much about working with individuals with Parkinson's? So this is a picture of my grandfather, Jerry. Jerry had Parkinson's, um, but Jerry had Parkinson's in a much different time than all of you. It was right when all of this research was emerging. So he was never really encouraged to exercise or um, work very extensively with a physical therapist. And about six years ago, I took the power certification course and was just blown away by what the research was saying in terms of the potential that individuals with Parkinson's could achieve. And so kind of with Jerry in mind, um, I went and started putting all of those power principles into work, uh, to work in the clinic. And I started to see really amazing results. And so I hope that you come away feeling as optimistic as I did when I took that first course. So we're gonna start with a really brief review of, very, very, very brief review of Parkinson's. But what Parkinson's is, is a degeneration of dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra. So that's a very deep brain structure. And so you can see in this image that this healthy neuron, there's a lot of dopamine being released. It travels to, across the synapse. It attaches over on this side. And that facilitates normal movement. What happens in Parkinson's is there's a degeneration of these neurons, so less dopamine is being re released. And that results in some of the common movement impairments that we all know with Parkinson's, such as tremor, rigidity, and slowed movements. So typical medical management is that a physician would prescribe dopamine replacement therapy. That can come in a variety of forms. The most common is Cinemet. So what that's trying to do is just add dopamine to the system to make up for this loss. 
So why is everybody telling you to exercise? I figured a picture is worth a thousand words. So these videos were kindly shared to me from a colleague, Claire, down in Southern California. She has a wonderful practice called Rogue Physical Therapy. I encourage you to check out her YouTube page. But th this is a video of someone that she started working with in 2016. Um, keep in mind, depending on your internet connection, I know when we play these Zoom videos, they come through a little choppy, but all of these videos are available on Rogue's YouTube page. So this is Terry, and Terry had the goal that she wanted to be able to jump rope when she started working with Claire. So if you look at the video all the way on the left, this was Terry's first approach or first attempt at jump roping. And you can kind of track her progress. If you look all the way to the right, that's Terry this past December jump roping. And so I think what's so powerful about this video is Terry has a degenerative neurological condition, but look at how much functional progress she's made in the three and a half years since working with Claire. Um, so it really shows the potential of hard work. This video is of an individual named Dennis. Um, when Dennis came in, he was having a lot of freezing when he was walking. So we'll look at the video on the left. You can see he's really having a hard time to get in a stride and it kind of gets cut off because Claire's jumping in to guard him. But his feet are getting caught. He has to step off the treadmill. He's really having a hard time getting going. And then you look at the gentleman walking on the right and that's Dennis four years later. And so I think if you saw him in that in that state at the gym, you wouldn't think twice. And so what I will caution is there's no magic that got Terry and Dennis. Um, there's no magic I have to give you that can get you to this point. But with a lot of hard work focused in the right areas, and they were both really committed to their exercise program, they were able to actually improve their physical status over the course of four years, again, with a degenerative neurological condition. So don't, I, I listed a lot of things, don't worry about reading this slide, but basically, because I have an illustration on the next page, but so why do Dennis and Terry look better four years down the road? So there's a researcher named Beth Fisher out of USC, and she's, she's doing a lot of research to look at what are the brain changes that are happening with exercise that can facilitate these improvements. It's more than the fact that they gained muscular strength and flexibility. There's changes at a brain level that are allowing them to function a lot better. And the sum total of all of these changes is that your dopamine system becomes much more efficient with exercise. So if we go back, if we go back to the first slide, again, you look at that bottom neuron, there is not as much dopamine being released by your neurons. So we don't want any of that dopamine there to go to waste. For myself, I probably have a little bit of excess of dopamine, but we want to be as efficient as possible with any dopamine that you still have in that synapse. So, Again, this is an image. Here's that dopamine neuron. The dopamine is getting released. It's attaching over on this side and by a very complex mechanism that's facilitating normal movement. So what Beth Fisher and her colleagues have found is one thing that happens in the brains of individuals that exercise is they have upregulation of their dopamine receptors. So again, any dopamine that you have has a much easier time of attaching 
and, and facilitating movement. The other thing about dopamine is that it's released into the synapse and then there's these um, dopamine transporter channels. So essentially dopamine gets released and then it gets pumped out of the synapse through these channels. The other thing exercise does is it down regulates those channels. So dopamine has an easier time attaching and it has, it, it gets longer, it stays in that synapse longer, so it has a longer time to work. You have more chance to use it. The final major finding of her group, we're not gonna get into the technicalities of this, but there's, there's this glutamate system that interferes with dopamine, it creates interference in the pathway. So what exercise does is it quiets those noisy interfering circuits so dopamine can work better. So again, even, even if we don't influence the overall amount of dopamine, you're able to do more with what you have because your pathway is much more efficient. So some more recent research showed some even more exciting results. And they, these researchers found that habitual exerciser, exercisers actually release more dopamine as a response to exercise. So what they did is they compared sedentary individuals with Parkinson's with habitual exercisers. And they define that as people that exercise greater than three times a week for greater than 180 minutes total. And they took these two groups, these exercisers and non-exercisers, and they had them both pedal for 30 minutes at a, on a bicycle at 60% max intensity. And then they did a PET scan. And with the PET scan, they were able um, to find some markers of how much dopamine were released in these individuals' brains. And so you can see here the habitual exerciser, exercisers are these light gray bars. So they, in fact, displayed an increased release of dopamine in response to exercise compared to sedentary individuals. And so a lot of clients I work with, despite the fact that they'll get very tired in my exercise class, they report that for the rest of the day, they actually feel really good. And we kind of call this the dopamine boost. Um, and it's actually one of the reasons, it's one of the ways that I hook people on to exercise. Um, because if you're, if you're exercising really consistently, and then let's say you go on vacation, or you just kind of get lazy one week and stop doing it. What I find is my clients miss that dopamine boost and they really come to realize what exercise is doing for them. So another important point from the research is that there, it's important to push yourself beyond your self-selected comfortable pace. Again, going back to that first slide, one of the things about Parkinson's is it makes your movement slower. So I often describe this, you know, just like your heart has a pacemaker, your brain has a pace at which it likes to move. And Parkinson's sets that pace a little bit slower. And so by pushing yourself, you sort of recalibrate. And Jay Alberts, he's from the Cleveland Clinic, he designed a very interesting study where he had uh, subjects ride on a tandem trainer. So if you look at that bike on the back would be the individual with Parkinson's and on the front was a researcher. And what their study did is they had a 10 minute warm up, a 10 minute cool down, but the middle 40 minutes, that researcher set the pace. And what they found on average was that about 60 revolutions per minute for most people feels pretty comfortable. So they had that researcher set the pace at 80 to 90 revolutions per minute. And then what they did is after the participant got off the bike, 
they performed an fMRI and they looked at activation in the brain. So if you look down in the right corner of your screen, so that middle image, that is the subject off medication at rest. And those little orange dots in the middle sort of represent the dopamine activity in that brain. So if you look at that image over to the right, that is the same subject after they took their levodopa or their pramipexil or whatever their medication is. And you can see that those, those orange dots get bigger. We've added dopamine to the system. That makes sense. There's more dopamine activity in the brain. But the really exciting thing about Jay Albert's research is if you look to the left, this is that same subject after exercising, but they're off medication. And so you can see, you know, these researchers concluded that this forced pedaling task while off medication resulted in an fMRI pattern that looks very similar to after somebody takes their cinnamon. So we know that intensity is important, but what intensity is best? And that's, that's really where the research is at right now. So this was a phase two trial that was completed a few years ago, and they're in a phase three of the current trial with more subjects. But what they wanted to do, we, we kind of know from the research that there's something about working between like 60 and 85% that it has been shown to be really beneficial. But there, there's a lot of variability. 60% max feels very different than 80, 85% max. So does it truly matter? So in this trial, they took subjects who at baseline were not exercising at a moderate intensity more than three times per week and they were not on any dopaminergic medication. So it was a pretty intense training trial. They had them perform treadmill training four days per week for 26 weeks. Again, there was a five, minute, five to 10 minute warm up and cool down, and then the intervention period for 30 minutes, they walked at a treadmill at either 80 to 85% max, or 60 to 65 percent max heart rate. One important thing to note from this study is they didn't have to be able to jump in and walk on a treadmill for 30 minutes at 85 percent max heart rate. They were given two months to ramp up to being able to perform the task at that speed. And so what they did is they had heart rate monitors and then would adjust the speed and the incline of the treadmill in order to get the target heart rate that they were looking for. Their outcome measure was the UPDRS motor score. So the UPDRS motor assessment is something that you probably do with your neurologist where they run you through all of those assessments. On the UPDRS, a lower score indicates less impairment in motor function. So looking at the results, the usual care or the control group displayed a significant increase in their UPDRS score over the course of six months. The subjects that exercised at 60 to 65% max heart rate also increased, but not, not as much. And these were all statistically significant jumps. The subjects that exercise at 80 to 85% max heart rate barely sh showed any change in their motor symptoms over time. So that's why research is really starting to lean towards this concept of higher intensity exercise for Parkinson's. But that can be very intimidating. And there's also some interesting research looking at the idea, can we replicate some of these results, but instead of 30 minutes at high intensity, 
can you perform exercises more in an interval design? So these researchers designed a cycling protocol. The participants cycled for three times a week, one hour, eight weeks total. Again, warm up and cool down. But the 40 minutes of training, they would do two minutes comfortable pace around 60 RPM, three minutes high intensity, 80 to 90 RPM. Then they would have that two minute recovery and then they would go again three minutes high intensity. They found that again, UPDRS scores looked better, psychomotor function looked better, and there were these brain boosting effects. Their outcome measure was a little bit different than the other studies we looked at. They looked at something called BDNF, it's a neurotrophic factor in the brain. And the thought is the higher the BDNF, you have better um, survival and activity of your dopaminergic neurons. It just promotes brain health. So this is a place where I often start with my clients when we're trying to um, start, start training at a higher intensity. A lot of times when I'm working with someone, I present this research and then their comment is, well, it sounds like I should maybe try to do this without medication. If this research is looking so promising that the, the medication looks similar to the exercise, should I be going that route? Now, I will say there are people that are, are very, um, very against medication and really try to go it alone. And there are examples of people that are able to do that. But as a broad consensus statement, the Parkinson's community really feels that the best outcomes are from when people have medication on board with exercise. And this opinion paper by the neurologist said that, you know, when he's prescribing medication, his goal is to get that individual to be able to perform their maximum ability to exercise. So if we know higher intensity exercise delays the progression of your Parkinson's, if you can optimize your medications so that you can go a little bit faster on the bike, long term, that is going to be what delays progression. The analogy I always use and some of you have heard it before, I apologize, but you walk up to a door and the door is locked and you're pulling on that door and you're trying to get it to move and you're sweating and you're working really hard and, and you're getting it to rattle around, but you're not quite getting that door to open. Sometimes the cinemat, the levodopa can just be that thing that unlocks the door for you so that when you put forth the effort with exercise, you see better outcomes. Likewise, my clients that are very exercise adverse, but very compliant with their medication, I tell them you're walking up to the locked door, you're unlocking it, and then you're standing there and you're not pulling it and you're saying, why isn't this door opening? You know, the medication alone isn't gonna get you where you need to be. You really need both working together. And that's why it's really important to work closely with both, you know, your trainer or your PT and your neurologist, because you really want that medication to be optimized before starting some of these high intensity programs. So we were talking a lot about aerobic exercise. So aerobic exercise is just something that gets your heart rate up. So you can think about, again, getting on a bike, pedaling at 80 RPMs. We're just trying to get your heart going, get blood up to your brain. The other thing that's been shown to be beneficial in the research is skilled motor training. And so what do we mean by that? Because this sort of exists on a continuum. So again, that activity that raises your heart rate, it improves blood flow to the brain, it facilitates neuroplasticity, and it just makes your brain healthier, that pure aerobic activity. 
what a motor skill training, so think about like boxing or tango, you're really having to learn how to perform a skill. And what that's really good at is improving your brain circuitry. So the aerobic exercise sets your brain up to be as healthy as possible. And then the skill training helps improve that circuitry. So it needs to be a challenging activity. It often requires coaching and it requires a lot of attention based on the individual that's performing it. But again, this, it, this exists on a continuum. So something purely aerobic would be just like trying to pedal as fast as you can on a bike without really thinking, you know, engaging too much cognitively in, in, what, in what's happening. And then something that's purely skill training would be something like Tai Chi which has been shown to be super beneficial to Parkinson's in terms of improving balance and weight shifting, but it's not very aerobic. So sort of having both aspects in your program are really important. And the nice thing is there are a number of activities that do both for you. So some examples are pole walking, that really makes you have to focus on coordination and be a little bit more engaged in what you're doing while also giving you a little bit more of an aerobic boost because you're having to use your upper extremities. Again, as I mentioned, tango, dance, boxing, these are all motivating. You have a goal, you're trying to repeat a dance step or a punch sequence. You have to be cognitively engaged in the activity. They involve motor planning, increased body awareness, but they're also getting your heart rate up, which is great. So my favorite motor skill training is something called power moves. And this is what I'm certified in and it's large amplitude movement training. So what do I mean by that? Again, Parkinson's results in bradykinesia, which is slowed movement. So something that's super common is when you were first getting diagnosed, you might have gone and walked for your neurologist and they said, you know, you're not swinging your left arm as much as you swing your right arm when you walk. That's bradykinesia. Why does it happen? So it's the result of two things. Number one, those muscles in the left arm, the brain is not communicating as well with the arm. Those muscles aren't getting activated. And there's also impaired sensory feedback. So you aren't necessarily able to feel the fact that you aren't swinging your left arm as much. And what happens over time is if we let these movements just get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, that sort of becomes your new normal for how you move. And so the power moves are high effort, whole body exercise, lots of reps, you're training bigger and faster, you're getting your heart rate up, but we're really focused on engaging in what we're doing, trying to move with our you know, most effort, which brings this sensory attention and body awareness. It's much different. It's not like weight, I always tell my clients, it's not like weight training is bad for you, but you think about sitting and just kind of zoning out and doing 10 reps of a bicep curl with a weight, you aren't as engaged when you're following along with a power moves routine. And what that does for you is that recalibrates your perception of what is normal movement. We kind of want to give your system this constant reset so you can feel what it's like to move big and fast and powerfully. The other thing that's really nice about the power moves, but also any sort of Parkinson's specific boxing class or Parkinson's specific dancing class, is that they're going to design the activities around skills that are really important for you. So the power moves, people that get certified, you essentially learn 
the think of it like getting certified in yoga you learn these moves they can be performed in a variety of positions on the floor in the chair in standing and then as an instructor you can start to string them together in different sequences and flows but they're always based on four main movements um, so the first one is a power up the, the power up movement is always to emphasize posture. We know that in Parkinson's, people can develop this stooped posture. They get tight across the front and their, their extension muscles aren't as strong and active. So the power up moves are really focused on getting you in better alignment. The power rock occurs in a variety of positions. But weight shifting is important. People with Parkinson's can have difficulty turning or rolling over in bed, freezing when they walk, and working on that rock really translates into function. The power twist, rigidity is something that individuals with Parkinson's deal with, and keeping the spine flexible and mobile really helps with your ease of movement. And then finally, the power step. Um, we again, we know shuffling when you walk is something that you might deal with, but even more importantly is delayed balance reactions. So we work on taking these big, powerful steps in a variety of directions so that you can really maintain normal balance reactions. So we're gonna to start to talk about how do we put some of this neuroplasticity research into practice. And to start, I wanna focus on what are the main considerations based on all of these studies. So the first thing is that timing matters. So again, much different than how my grandfather was managed, now we take a very proactive approach when we look at exercise and physical therapy. So instead of waiting till someone is falling and needs a walker and sending them to physical therapy at that point, now people are getting sent to me weeks, months after initial diagnosis, because if we know exercise has all of these brain healing benefits, we might as well start early and, and just be really proactive in our approach. We also want to early on identify barriers to exercise. So these can be not having enough time, being limited because of pain, not being motivated. You know, I can work as hard as I want to give somebody a gym program, but if they feel uncomfortable walking into a gym to do that, that's really important for me to know. So I think working one-on-one -on -one with somebody and working through like, what are your barriers to getting started on an exercise program is really important. The other main point is that there's a continuous threshold of exercise that's needed. You have to make exercise a daily habit. And this isn't something where you can go to PT two times a week for eight weeks and then revisit exercise again in a year when you get sent back to physical therapy. You really need to transition from physical therapy into a community-based exercise program. And that's why I started teaching the class because I would work with these patients in the clinic and I would teach them all the power moves, but then it was really hard for people to stay motivated at doing them in their house by themselves. So that's where the, commute, the Parkinson's specialized community piece is really important. Reward is important. So boxing could have all the research in the world behind it, but if you go to a boxing class and you hate it and you dread going every week, that is not the right activity for you. And so again, working one-on-one -on -one and finding something that you enjoy and that is in line with your interest and something that you can be compliant with over the long term is really important. My patients that struggle the most are ones that come in gangbusters, start exercising seven days a week, 
and then kind of crash and burn and do nothing for six months. I would rather you start with little changes, but keep them really consistent and make your exercise program really manageable. So complexity and specificity matters. So we want things that you're engaged cognitively in, and it really helps um, if you can be performing specific exercises that have, are addressing some of your Parkinson's related impairments. The other huge message from the research is that intensity is important. And this can be a tough one to know how, how to make a part of your routine. So again, we know that exercise should push you beyond your self-selected effort. So how can you start to achieve this? So one way is exercising with a coach, whether it's a PT or a trainer or in a class generally you'll work harder in a class than you would if you took 60 minutes to exercise at home. The other thing you can start to do is monitor your heart rate. So if you go on a regular walking program, monitor your heart rate. You know, there's tons of wearables these days, Fitbits and Apple watches, just to get an idea, where are you at with the things that you're already doing? We'll talk about rating of perceived exertion on the next slide, but it's also a way to measure how hard you're working when you're doing something. I do also think that while I know cardio equipment like treadmills and ellipticals and bikes can be very, very boring, and they're not the right choice for everyone, they are very beneficial in the sense that you can adjust the speed, you have a speed uh, whether it's revolutions per minute or miles per hour, and you can really target your intensity by dialing up the speed on the cardio equipment. And again, it's different than a class. Like in a class, usually you're working hard and then taking a rest break and, you know, there's, there's interruptions and you're taking breaks where, you know, if you get on a treadmill and do interval training for 25 minutes, that's a really great sustained level of heart rate elevation. Considering safety is really important. So you really wanna talk with your physician, especially if you have any sort of cardiac history before diving into high intensity exercise. For example, um, you could be on a medication that artificially lowers your heart rate a little bit. Um, so we aren't gonna to want to monitor your heart rate. That isn't gonna be a meaningful measure of how hard you're working. So definitely talking with your physician if, if you're new to higher intensity exercise. And I also think working one-on-one -on -one with somebody, uh, working one-on-one -on -one with a physical therapist to try it out while being monitored before going it alone. So there's a few ways to calculate max heart rate or target heart rate. I just went with the simplest. So if you look at the bottom, what you do is you take 220 minus your age, and that gives you what your maximum heart rate is. So for somebody that's 65 years old, their max heart rate is 155 beats per minute. We don't need you at max, but then we look at 80% intensity, is 124 beats per minute, and 60% intensity is 93 beats per minute. So earlier today, I was working with a client, and he's kind of doing intervals with running, and he, he wanted to know if he was doing the right thing. Well, he wears a Fitbit. Um, he's, oh, I think he's like 67, and from his Fitbit, he was able to see that when he's running, his heart rate gets up to 125 beats per minute. So it was really helpful for him to know that even though he's doing these intervals when he exercises, he is in the, in the right zone for how hard he should be working. So the most challenging thing about delivering a lecture to a large group is everybody wants to know, like, can I put something up on the screen? And if I follow this, that's what I need to do. And the challenge is um, that, that you're all very different in, in where you're coming at exercise. 
So you should aim to, to it, it's just gonna be dependent on where you're starting from. So the rating of perceived exertion scale looks at, if you had to rate yourself on a scale of one to 10, how hard are you working? So what I always tell people is you should aim to do some form of exercise most days of the week. And I know that feels daunting, but I'm not saying do high intensity exercise most days of the week, some form of exercise. And what I would really like you to shoot for is three days of moderate to high intensity exercise at a minimum. So again, high intensity exercise, it's that heart rate close to 80. And then if you look at this scale, it's RPEs in the zone of seven to 10. A good starting, um, a good place to shoot for is maybe 30 to 45 minutes. You won't be able to do that high intensity exercise quite as long. Moderate intensity exercise, your heart rate is 60% max, your RPEs are more in this four to six range. And you're looking at, again, two to three weeks, maybe a little bit longer, 45 to 60 minutes. And then, like I said, low intensity exercise like Tai Chi or these other things can be really helpful. I just don't necessarily want to count it towards that minimum of three days. So any yoga, tai chi, qigong can sort of be in addition, as long as you're getting that minimum three days a week of aerobic training, really with a goal of most days trying to get something aerobic in. So how this could look, maybe you participate in a boxing class or a power moves class. You do that, you know, you have two classes a week then you do three moderate intensity walks or bike rides and then you have a tai chi class that you do one time a week so you want you want those activities to be variable i definitely don't want you doing high intensity exercise every day And this is all well and good, but our world has been turned upside down. So how do we accomplish some of this during our current times? So in light of COVID, um, we're all having to really vary, especially if you were somebody that really relied on group classes or going to gyms or working with a trainer. We're, we're having to think outside the box a little bit. But again, the important thing is that you find something that you enjoy and you will perform consistently. So if you're looking to boost your cardi cardio at home, you know, a very low budget option is to take a look at your walk. And especially for those of us in San Francisco, add some hills and stairs to your walk so that you're getting, a heart, you're getting your heart rate up a little bit more and there's higher intensity. Another option that's a, a lower cost investment like we talked about is pole walking. I wrote here, there's a company, Urban Poling. They make a set of poles called activator poles. It's a way to get a little more bang from your buck if you're taking a 30 minute walk when you're out and about. Sort of the next tier is definitely more of an investment and not something that everyone can do, but really considering if you have the means potentially investing in cardio equipment for home. I think unfortunately what the past week or two have taught us is that this is going to be with us for a little bit and it might be a while before we can get back into the gym. Um, and so having a piece of equipment in your home might be something that can be really helpful while we're dealing with this. I don't really care what that equipment is. So if you're somebody that has issues with balance, a bike might be a really great safe option for you, a way to work at a higher intensity but still be really safe. Ellipticals, rowing machines, stair masters. They're all great. Some people love them, some people hate them. 
And then treadmills, the, the nice thing about a treadmill is it translates directly to function. So if you think about those first videos, Dennis, not only was he working on getting his heart rate up on the treadmill, but he was also really working on his walking efficiency and freezing of gait. I think the silver lining of COVID is there's a ton of virtual exercise classes for individuals with Parkinson's. And I think after this is resolved, I think that will continue to be an option. Lots of colleagues I know, even when they can go back to in-person programming, are going to keep a component of virtual classes available because they are so convenient. Um, I know that we lose something by being in the room together and um, kind of feeding off the energy of each other, but the convenience of it is, is pretty great. So I'll give you more information about the class that I'm involved with in a minute, um, but then also those initial slides from Rogue Physical Therapy. She has an online platform, so there's, there's tons of things out there. The other thing that's really important when you've had a change in your routine, it's finding a way to stay accountable. So you really have to set a schedule, like at a very basic level, if you're trying to get into exercise, you really need to set a schedule and just be rigid about it and make exercise a habit. So every day at 10, I'm gonna go and I'm going to, um, I'm gonna go for a walk outside. And you literally track it on a calendar so that when you look back at the week, if you're constantly saying, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, that's a really great visual reminder of how active you're staying. Again, considering an activity tracker, so a Fitbit or an Apple Watch can be really helpful to help you monitor how much you're moving. So I'm involved in something called PD Connect, and it is a nonprofit organization. It's based out of the Bay Area, and all of the people that are involved with PD Connect have really have extensive training in, in Parkinson's. Um, the classes are donation-based, and Again, due to COVID, all of the classes right now are being live streamed. So there's five days a week of programming over Zoom. So I put my email again at the end, but this is the website. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, definitely reach out. I'm just gonna go back one second. Okay, so there wasn't um, a great place to put this slide, but I wanted to include it somewhere. And it's the idea that exercise is also really beneficial to treating some of the non-motor Parkinson's symptoms. So if you think about your tremor and your rigidity and your slowness of movement, that's sort of the tip of the iceberg. And below the surface is all of these other symptoms. So cognition or emotion, autonomic dysfunction. And the really interesting thing is the Parkinson's medications, the carbidopa levodopa, the pramipexol, doesn't really show, um, does any show any positive effects in terms of these non-motor symptoms. So my additional plug to you in terms of exercise is that um, it, this could be a whole nother topic in and of itself, but exercise has really been shown to um, target some of these non-motor symptoms as well, which can sometimes be more frustrating to my clients than the motor symptoms. And then also there's other lifestyle habits that influence exercise. So, you know, your overall health and wellness, is, it's important. You have to feel your best to be able to engage in exercise. Again, a whole, we could do a whole lecture on diet and stress management, 
sleep. Um, all of those things have to be optimized for you to feel your best to exercise. A lot of times I get asked by clients, is it good to do massage or acupuncture or see a chiropractor? Now, that's not going to necessarily improve the function of your dopamine receptors by going for a massage, but if it alleviates your pain and helps you exercise, then it's extremely important that that's part of your routine. I also think hobbies. So when you're, it can start to feel like, all I, all I, my whole life is just going to be like exercise and taking my pills four times a day. And if you like to paint or you like to sing or you're a writer, like it's important to make time for all of those activities in, in your routine as well. And also socialization. So there is a naturopath, Dr. Lori Mishley. I have her name here. Um, side note, if you're interested in diet, look up um, her name. Uh, she's very involved on that end of things. But she did this CAM care in Parkinson's study. And she found that loneliness was the single biggest predictor. So she asked patients all of these questions about lifestyle. And patients that said, I am lonely, that was, a that was the single biggest predictor of the rate of a faster rate of Parkinson's disease progression. So I think, you know, again, with COVID right now, even if we can stay involved in our virtual group exercise classes, the more we can have a community that supports us, the better the outcomes will be. So in conjunction with that, I really think it's important to build your Parkinson's team. So you think about you're in the middle and you have to build this team of supports. You, your job is not to be able to listen to this lecture and 100% put a program in place. So you need your doctor and your neurologist optimizing your medication. You need your community exercise. You need a physical therapist that you check in and you need all these people that you can rely on. So I really feel the first step is education. And so you all have that in the bag. You're here tonight. You're trying to understand the research, understand these recommendations that people are making for you. And then I think it's important to build, if possible, a network of healthcare providers that communicate together. So if you see a neurologist and they have some Parkinson-specific PTs that they work with, that can be a really effective team if they communicate back and forth. And then if the PT has an exercise class that they send patients to, the more you can build your little network, then everybody's sort of staying on top of things and keeping you moving. Again, I really recommend regular bouts of skilled PT. So the tough thing, like I said, insurance-based physical therapy, might pay for eight to 12 sessions. And then, um, but if you can use that really val and get a lot of value out of that, it can be really helpful to check in for that one-on-one -on -one time, maybe once or twice a year. And, and that's your time. Insurance-based physical therapy, if you have something, if you're trying to go to classes and you're having pain or, you're falling more, like you, every time you open a door, you find that you're falling backwards or you're having trouble turning around in the bathroom. If you have some specific things that you want to work on, that's, that's really great for insurance-based physical therapy. And then community exercise, that's sort of your maintenance program. So how are you going to maintain the appropriate levels of fitness and wellness in between your rounds of physical therapy. And you really want a home program that combines aerobic training and some of that skill training. So I'm gonna open it up to questions in a minute, but one thing I really want to emphasize is some people can be really energized by this talk and some people can be really intimidated. And I think it's really, really important to meet yourself where you are. So if you're somebody that isn't doing a whole lot of exercise, 
you might be starting with trying to pedal on a bike for 10 minutes without stopping. Or, um, you know, you're trying to go for a walk for 10 minutes without stopping. I think a good goal to work up to is being able to do 30 minutes of some sort of continuous aerobic activity. We're not worried about intensity, but if you can start today at I'm not doing anything, get yourself walking 10 minutes and progress to the point of walking 30 minutes, that's a great starting place. Also keeping in mind that idea of interval training. So it's fine that the research used that 60 RPMs and 80 RPMs, but you might not be there yet. You might get on a bike and you're pedaling at 30 RPMs. So you're gonna get on the bike, that's your comfortable pace. And then for your fast interval, you're gonna go up to 40. So again, meeting, use the concept of interval training, but meet yourself where you are today. And that's where some one-on-one -on -one coaching can help you apply this research, research to your specific situation. Let's say you already have a pretty robust program, but you wanna add intensity into your program. Remember that in that one study, those people ramped up over the course of eight weeks. So maybe you're doing high intensity work on the elliptical, but every five minutes, you're just taking a break. You're not interval, you're just taking a break. Um, so that's a really great way that I start with patients. Maybe every 10 minutes, you're taking a break and then you're working up to, um, can I do 20 minutes high intensity, take a five minute break and another 20 minutes high intensity. So just know that um, I've never found someone um, who can't make progress with this if they make it a habit and are committed to it. And it doesn't matter where you're starting from. Um, we, can definitely, we can definitely make gains. So um, I'm gonna open up the floor to questions. If, if not, we're gonna do a little exercise demo. Question here for you. Um, yeah. It's asking for clarification. Suggestion is 30 to 35 minutes of aerobic at 80% an hour. That is continuous, um, such as running or cycling? That is gonna be dependent on where, on where you're at. But yes, high intensity, getting in that 80% heart rate max, we're shooting for at least 30 minutes. And again, it depends. So if you can run for 30 minutes at 80% max, that's fine. If you're not there yet, you would have um, two options. And so one would be doing some of that interval training. The other option would be, like I said, taking a break. So if you're trying to run for 30 minutes, maybe you're running 10 minutes, stopping, taking a break, 10 minutes again, um, and so forth. Could you explain how that works again? Like you said, we, ta we take 220, 220 minus our age. Mine would be 150. And what, and what, is, what is 150? 150 is the RPMs? So 150 is your maximum heart rate. So my, that's... Oh, okay, my maximum yeah. heart rate. And so then you have to decide... Do you want to exercise at 60% of your max heart rate? So that would be the 150 times 0.6. Or are you shooting for 80%? So that would be 150 times 0.8. Does that make sense? Yes. So like the 60%, it would be 90 heart rate, maximum heart rate. Correct. So... Maximum, maximum heart rate would be 90, 90 RPMs, right? So this is different than RPMs. This oh, is okay. just how, how fat, how hard your heart is beating. So oh. your, the thought is 220 minus age is like 
that's like you're exercising all out. You don't have to be there, but you want to be, you want to start to target that range of 60 to 85%. So if you were pedaling on the bike at, um, you know, 75 RPMs, we would hope that your heart rate is getting in that zone of that 60 to 85%. Does that make sense? Yes, got you, got you. And how, uh, and we would do, and this is what, where the, the Fitbits come in, because they help exactly, us. Exactly, like a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, you know. You know, I know you participate in my class, so the idea would be, you know, we're doing one of our high intensity intervals for if you could look at your Fitbit and say, oh, my heart rate is 120 beats a minute right now. Like I'm in the appropriate intensity zone. Got you. All right. That's really helpful. I, I wanted to try, try to understand that. Thank you. Okay. So two questions came through privately. So one person was asking, um, does playing a wind instrument, so a tuba or a French horn, does that count as aerobic exercise? So that is a very valuable exercise for individuals with Parkinson's. Um, you know, if you've heard of like the loud programs, working on speaking loudly, projecting your voice, um, all of that is, is very beneficial, much like Tai Chi and yoga, but I wouldn't necessarily count that to aerobic exercise. The other question I got was, I have peripheral neuropathy. Will this program help me stay mobile? Definitely some of, you know, the idea, the concepts of aerobic exercise is beneficial across the continuum. So these are principles that can apply to anyone who's looking to improve their brain health. It doesn't have to be Parkinson specifically, um, but the research that kind of we presented today was was dealing more directly with individuals with Parkinson's. Any other questions? Okay, so then what I think we're gonna do, um, some of you are in my class and some of you are not, but what we're gonna do, I'm gonna move you over here. We're gonna do a little demonstration of what a power move is. So let me just stop my video just for a second. So you can just get a feel for what it is that I'm talking about with these power moves. Okay. So the idea is, like we said, we're trying to get you to move bigger and faster and more powerfully. Excuse my daughter's doll over on the couch. But the idea is you're going to we're going to we're going to demonstrate the the power move. So we're going to start with the power up. So you can come stand up where you are or you can just watch. So the idea is my hands are on my knees and then I'm going to power up. So I'm reaching all the way through my fingertips. I'm really activating those extensors in my shoulder blades. And I'm coming all the way down, all the way up, flicking my hands, lots of attention to movement really trying to work on that nice upright posture. Second, we're gonna go into a power rock. So I'm gonna come down, I'm gonna make a fist, and I'm gonna rock up to the side. And I'm gonna come down and rock, down and rock. Next is a power twist. So my arms are extended. I clap my hand to the side, open up big, clap to the other side, open up big, really working on that spinal flexibility. The last move is a power step. 
So I'm going to take a big step to the side, open up my hand, and then come back to the middle. Big step out to the other side, come back to the middle. So we're going to go through just like four repetitions of each. Um, and you can sort of see how you string it into a flow. So we're going to come to the power up. You can do these sitting or standing, hands to your lap, power up one. Come down to your lap, power up two. Down, power up three. Down, power up four. We're going to rock, come down, rock, down, three, down, four. We're going to twist over to the left. Open, twist, open, three, open, four. And now we're going to step to the left. Step in, step in, step in, step. So that is what a power move is. Um, again, any of the Parkinson specific type exercise classes, whether, whether it's boxing or dance, they're all focused on that idea of training with amplitude and speed to help target those Parkinson's related impairments. Um, but again, I provided my email. Don't hesitate to reach out with questions. Um, we'll open it up one more time if anybody has any questions. Uh, Jennifer? Yep. Hi. Um, I wasn't able to uh, be here earlier, so I don't know if you said, um, are, are you current, are your exercise classes currently online? Yeah, so I'm involved with an organization called PD Connect. Right. Um, and we're currently doing virtual classes, so they're live streamed through Zoom, and they're being offered five days a week. So I happen to teach the class on Tuesdays, um, but there are, there are classes available through PD Connect five days per week. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you all for taking the time out of your schedule to be here tonight. Um, if you're here tonight, that definitely means that this is something you're interested in, and I definitely think you have the potential to put some of this into play. So that's great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. What you're doing is important. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate all the information you gave us tonight. No problem. And then just for the people that are here, one question for you. Are the, I know the video is going to be posted online. Do they have any ability to access the slides? Yes. Oh. So, um, so I will be in the, here, in this feedback survey that I just posted in the chat box again, um, there is a question that asks whether you want the slides emailed to you or not. And um, that's how I will be able to send the slides out to participants who want them. Great. Yep. Uh and um, when I email all of you about um, completing the survey or um, just to update you on the video editing that I, because this, this uh, lecture was recorded, and I will update it, uh, sorry, edit and then upload it onto our chrcsf.org website, and you will be able to find the whole video there, um, along with our other resources such as previous lectures or, um, or mini nutrition videos. Is that open to the public? Or yes, absolutely. Maybe, Jen, is it possible, Jen, you could give um, us the link to that? Definitely. Yeah, I will send that out to all of you. 
Oh, okay. thank well, you. Well, this, this applies to people that take my class. Sorry. Right. So when I say right. all of you, if you're on my class email list, I will get this information to you. Yes. I will also find, um, I think I have everybody's email here who signed, who signed up. So I will also oh. send that information out to you all. Great. Oh, really appreciate it. No problem at all. Um, and if you guys have any more questions for Jennifer, please feel free to use this opportunity to ask. Um, if not, we'll give it a few more um, a few more moments before we sign off. I thought this was a really excellent presentation, Jen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I work with Twin, and actually, I I um, found your info because my brother has Parkinson's, and he he um, missed the lecture. He's out kayaking with his wife. He uh -huh. me. well, great. He's doing his aerobic <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure he sees the video, and I suggested to Twin. I said, you know, I really think we should do a class on this. So I'm really pleased with how it turned out. Great. So we have a new participant who just joined. Um, while the lecture is over, and I will be sending out a video of this lecture, um, if you have any questions, this new participant, this is the time where we're doing Q&A. Feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask Jennifer any question you'd like. Well, I just want to say, Jennifer, that I, I, I appreciate it. what's important here for me, because I is... Uh, the, the, to hear the research, that there's a lot of good research coming out in this, because when I first got diagnosed, people said that, it, that we should exercise, 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 that that was the thing to do, but we didn't hear a lot of the research base on it, so it's important to hear the research base. And I found when I started after diagnosis, I did not take med medicine, I just exercised every day profusely and it helped me a lot but I found that I still that even with all the exercise I was doing I still felt um, I noticed and, and other people were noticing that my movements were getting slower over time so I added the, med, the medicine un, un, uh, unfortunately because I didn't want to take medicine but I added it and for sure, it's given me a boost in my ability to maintain my exercise regimen, and particularly at a, a, a higher intensity levels. Yeah, that's really great. And I think that taking that step to taking medicine is always really hard for people. A lot of us and every other, you know, myself, I'm, I'm very averse in other aspects of my life to taking medication and, um, that for a lot of people who making that leap, it's, it's difficult. Um, but yeah, I think that's great that you were able to sort of optimize your exercise with the medication. And like I said, it's kind of a new, it's a new era for Parkinson's and a lot of people come in who are newly diagnosed and they're comparing themselves to a grandfather or a father. And, and, and it's just really important to know that their Parkinson's was managed completely differently than your Parkinson's is being managed now. There wasn't this push to exercise. There wasn't this push to early use of medication. Um, so you can't like overly compare yourself to those individuals because you're sort of part of this group of people that's holding yourself a lot more steady. Um, but what's unknown is what's the potential. So we have those videos of Terry and Dennis, but we don't know, like we just have all of these really active people maintaining and we just don't quite know what the end point is right now. So, um, so while it's, while it's, I can't always accurately predict for my clients, at least it's, it's a lot more optimistic than things were, you know, 15, 20 years ago. It'd be important for people to do longitudinal studies 
um, people. Well, and that's what a lot of the research I'm presenting is now there's additional phases with more participants and they're going to run the studies longer for exactly yeah. that reason to get some, right. more, some more answers. And also hopefully get more funding for some of these community programs. Like if we can show by regular participation in these programs that your Parkinson's remains better controlled, like could we get insurance to pay for more of this community programming? Absolutely, I'm convinced of it. I'm, I'm really convinced of it. I think I think the studies would show that that we we would maintain ourselves at a at a, a higher functioning level for much longer. Exactly. I I have one more. Oh yeah, um, go for it. So, can you overdo it? Like if I ride my bike in one direction for thirty minutes and I get to my destination, I ride my bike back another thirty minutes and I have my heart rate at. 80% is like, is that overdoing it? Is, is, is it harmful? So it's, it depends on how you feel. So I definitely skew these talks towards pushing people towards it to intensity because I feel like on the whole, people are underdosed in terms of exercise. I think that's one of the failings of like a typical physical therapy model is individuals with Parkinson's aren't getting pushed enough. But that being said, on some occasions, I do have people that come in and I think that they're overdoing it. And signs of overdoing it would be physical. So it's, you know, you're, you're feeling completely worn out that day, the next day, um, completely drained by whatever that exercise was. You aren't feeling that dopamine boost or burnout. Like it's really important to monitor for burnout. Cause like I said, we don't want you to be going so hard that you then crash and burn. Yeah. Um, but if you're feeling okay with that level of exercise and you don't have any cardiac issues that we're concerned about, I tend to not be as worried about overdoing it um, as underdoing it. Okay. I was, I was wondering, because I was looking at my graph from my heart rate monitor from doing boot camp, and I'm in between 60 and 85 percent from for um to be in the zone mm -hmm. and it's it's tendon it so it goes up and down within that so it's not always at 80 85 percent and it's so i thought oh now i'm gonna have to go out and ride my bike to get <laughs> my heart rate up oh uh, yeah no if you're kind of like in that zone um and it's for now yeah that's great yeah. <laughs> oh okay all right. Phew. Jennifer, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. It was oh, excellent. Thank I you learned guys. a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, thank you so much, Jennifer, um, for that wonderful and research-focused lecture and that demo. Um, I really appreciate you joining us, and I loved the discussion at the end. Everybody seems to really enjoy you and want to talk to you, and I hope that this is a good indication that we could also have you return for future lectures with CHRC as well. Yes. Um, and again, if anybody here has more questions, we have um, three more minutes before the class concludes. If you do have a question, I think it's best if you would just unmute and ask out loud. Jennifer, is it, is it possible to have a, one a private consult with you? I mean, obviously that would, you know, to pay for 
But yeah, honestly, so if you email me, that's definitely something that I'm um, offering um, right now, working with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so if you grabbed my email from that last slide, um, feel free to reach out and I, I'd be happy to discuss some options with you. Thank you. All right. Um, so as we conclude, I also want to let you know that Thursday, um, next Thursday at 3.30, CHRC is hosting another health lecture. It's free and it'll be on Zoom. It's titled, Is Cannabis Right for You? And Are You Right for Cannabis? It is a mini lecture by a cannabis nurse who discusses cannabis in palliative care. And then it will, uh, following that will be a panel with more healthcare providers such as nurses, a patient, and we'll also have a moderator. Um, I will also, I will share that information when I share the video link with you all. That should arrive in your inbox by the end of tomorrow. Usually takes me around a day to finish editing and uploading. Um, if you have any questions for me, I, you can always reply to the email that I send out by tomorrow. Um, thank you so much. Jennifer, do you have anything else to add? Nope, that's it. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule and don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Thank you very much, Jennifer. No problem. You're terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.